That night, Prime Minister Eshkol's military advisor, Colonel Lior, is awakened with the news of the closing of the Straits of Tehran. He rushes to the Ministry of Defense and is asked to report to its underground bunker, the Army War Room. I thought war was going to break out the same day. We cannot give the Egyptian army more time to organize. I woke up Eshkol on the direct line. Sir, the Egyptians closed the straits. At 8 a.m., Eshkol meets with several generals in the war room, including Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin and the head of intelligence, Aharon Yariv. If Israel does not respond to the closing of the straits, it will lose its power of deterrence. Israel's credibility, determination, and capacity to exercise its right to self-defense are being tested. Israel must respond. Eshkol listens to the generals carefully, but he tells them that President Johnson has advised Israel not to shoot first. As always, Eshkol is cautious. He decides to sound out international opinion, and he postpones the decision to go to war for 48 hours. <laughs> Meanwhile, the closing of the Straits of Tehran electrifies the Arab world, and Radio Cairo beats the drums of war. <laughs> The masses were very excited, sure that their army could win. Feelings were very high among all Egyptians, including us in the media. It was obvious that Gamal Abdel Nasser had a very advanced Arab vision. From the Persian Gulf to the Atlantic Ocean, Nasser was the man we were all waiting for. It is true some people say that Nasser was all talk. But actually, the Arab world was ready to follow him. The Arab world was ready to sacrifice for a successful project. Nowhere in the Arab world is Nasser more admired than in East Jerusalem. Here, the Palestinians, many of them refugees from the 48 war, look to him for salvation. The people were looking towards Abdel Nasser. If you took a popularity poll, there were probably more Palestinians supported Nasser than Egyptians. You know, I mean, he was an incredible hero. I remember seeing his face on prayer rugs. I was shocked by that. What are you doing with a face of Abdel Nasser on a prayer rug? I mean, he was such an extraordinary hero as if he could do no wrong. Nasser's preparation for war makes it possible for hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees displaced 20 years earlier to dream of returning to their villages and farms that are now part of Israel. Here in this part of the world, in the Arab country, no one, no one accept uh, this uh, idea about forgetting all the past, all the uh, 20 years, and close our eyes and uh, leave everything as it is. Nasser has dramatically revised his agenda. The looming conflict is no longer about deterring Israel from attacking Syria or controlling the Straits of Tehran. Now he talks about turning the clock back 20 years to before the State of Israel was created. Radio Cairo delivers this message to Israelis in their own language. Nasser, 
And because there is no Israeli television in 1967, Israelis watch Egyptian television in Arabic. You turn on the TV and you watch Egyptian television, and you see the celebration in the streets. You see Nasser sitting down in the airbase in Sinai with the MiG-21 pilots in their G-suits ready for combat, smiling from ear to ear. You see the massive amount of tanks entering Sinai. We had the feeling that we were being suffocated, that they were going to destroy us all. The Arab press is contributing to the frenzy with its anti-Semitic caricatures of Jews. Israel is shown crushed, pierced, and destroyed in the coming war. Israelis prepare for the worst. Rabbis consecrate parks to serve as mass graveyards. Civilians are called to donate blood and dig trenches. Most of the able-bodied men are called into service. Most factories and stores are closed. Every truck, every bus, every human being was gone. The economy was at an absolute dead standstill, waiting, you see. And so it was clear that this couldn't last. I was very afraid to leave home. We were just waiting for a plane to come bomb us. I remember that in my heart I had decided that if we were conquered, I would turn on the gas and we would die together. I would not want my children to be hurt by them, and I would not want to fall into their hands either. The Arab propaganda has an impact beyond Israel. For Jews everywhere, it ignites a deep-seated fear that another Holocaust is in the making. Young Jewish volunteers pour into Israel. I'm just going there because I feel, you know, the need to go there at this particular time. I feel that I'm, I identify strongly with Israel, and I feel that they need me perhaps now more than they will next year. We return to the days of the War of Independence, when the threat was really a threat of annihilation. And the public thought, here we are, not even 20 years later, and we are again facing a threat to our existence. So naturally, the Jews panicked. 